right. Oh. But I think what I'm doing is feeding through your 20 seconds behind me. So I think we're okay. Um, it's Friday, uh, May 15th, 10.02, 10, uh, Senate Natural Resources Energy. We're convening to follow up on our work on uh, solid waste discussions, particularly as they relate to COVID. Um, so we took quite a lot of testimony on um, uh, yesterday, and we have a couple of people that either dropped off the call, lost a connection, whatever. We will hear from two people briefly uh, a little further down in the meeting, but for now, uh, a priority, especially while we have both the commissioner and Mr. Grady with us, is to turn to um, looking at some language and looking at the legal landscape around being quote unquote flexible. So there are things like variances, waivers, there's enforcement discretion. And I think sort of the bottom line question is the committee will need to decide what kind of flexibility, if any, we're interested in assuring exists in the system. And then secondly, how would it be accommodated? Is current law already provide for that or would we need something new? I think that's, that's just teeing up, I think, what we're trying to sort through this morning. So with that, um, Mr. O'Grady, if you could um, walk us through what you've pulled together for us, and thank you for doing that. Sure. I'm going to share uh, my screen, and it'll take me one second. Okay. Um, and committee members, uh, just for uh, future reference, whatever, that uh, Mr. O'Grady's uh, handout also is posted and was emailed to you as a PDF in case you're wanting to print it, keep it, mark it up, etc. Great. So okay, does, you... does everyone see it? Looks great. Okay, so uh, the chair asked me to summarize some of the authority that the Agency of Natural Resources has under statute to address potential um, requests or applications to um, waiver or basically um, not enforce some of the universal recycling requirements that have been uh, discussed by your committee and interested parties over the past couple of weeks. Uh, the agency does uh, have in statute a variance authority, um, 10 VSA 6613. Um, there's a general authority in subsection A when a person who owns or is in control of any plant, building, structure, process, or equipment may apply to the secretary for a variance from the rules. And I emphasize rules for a, re for a reason. And the secretary may grant a variance if he or she finds the variance uh, proposed does not endanger, or tend to endanger human health or safety, complies with the rules for which a uh, variance is sought, with compliance with those rules will produce serious hardship. Uh, without greater or equal benefits to the public and the variance does not enable the applicant to generate transport treat store or dispose of hazardous waste in a way that is less stringent than federal RICRA. So uh, the agency has said uh, that they basically historically have never issued variances from statute under that subsection A. Um, that they've only used it to provide variances um, from their discretionary authority under the rules to protect human health and the environment or prevent nuisances. And normally what they have provided variances for have been setback requirements or other operational controls that, um, and they do not use it to uh, provide variances to something that has been uh, clearly articulated in statute as legislative policy. But there is a specific provision in the variance authority subsection B for those facilities that are um, subject to the management requirements of 6605 J2 or three. And those are the universal recycling requirements for leaf residuals and food residuals. So there is specific variance authority for a facility that is subject to those requirements. And if the applicant demonstrates alternative services, including on-site management are available in the area served by the facility, the alternative services have capacity to serve the needs of all persons served by the facility requesting the variance and the alternative services are convenient 
then the agency has the ability to issue a variance from the universal recycling requirements for leaf residuals and food residuals for facilities. Um, now, I want to note that any variance requires a notice and an opportunity for public meeting requirement. And ANR must consider the relevant interest of the applicant versus the interest of interested parties and the general public. And then the variance is granted for time periods and under conditions consistent with the reasons subject to the request and subject to statutory limitations based on the reasons it was issued. So that's the variance authority. Does anyone have any questions? All right, I was hearing silence, I'm moving on. Um, there's also waiver authority for commercial haulers. Now, technically there are three uh, waiver provisions, but really only one is of, of real broad application. But first, let's look at what would be waived. Um, so the requirements for commercial haulers are in G1A and B. And so beginning on July 1, 2015, a hauler shall offer to collect mandated recyclables separate from other solid waste and deliver them to a facility maintained and operated for the management of, recycling, <laughs> of mandated recyclables. Similarly, beginning on July 1, 2020, shall offer to non-residential customers in apartment buildings with four or more residential units, a collection of food residuals separate from solid waste and delivered to a, a location that manages food residuals in, in a manner consistent with the, the food residual priority hierarchy. Um, they are not required to offer collection of food residuals if another commercial hauler provides collection services for food residuals in the same area and has sufficient capacity to provide service to all customers. So right there, there's a provision that haulers don't need to provide services if there's alternative services in that area. <coughs> so moving down to the waiver provisions, the first one, sub B, sub two, this is really only in those municipalities, solid waste management entities that um, My have- goodness. Yep. Sorry, uh, can I, a quick question on that section you just finished going through with, um, you don't, a hauler does not need to offer collection services for food residuals in the same area. Uh, if there's a, someone doing it and they have su su sufficient capacity. So um, one of the things that comes up from time to time in these discussions is the ability to subcontract. If there is someone else, so a hauler could subcontract that workout does that um, isn't, I was just trying to make sure that's still a valid way for them to meet the requirement. Someone else could provide that service on their behalf. Uh, yes, I, I definitely think that subcontracting is an alternative for a hauler. Uh, you know, the subcontracted hauler would likely need to meet all the, haul, the you know, the permitting and certification requirements under statute, but um, if they do, I don't see any reason why a hauler can subcontract. Um, I don't necessarily know if that affects that provision that allows a hauler not to offer a collection. Um, you know, if, if there was a, a service in the area, I think it would be up to A&R to make that determination for a commercial hauler. Okay. Um, okay, great. I mean, I think that's part of the challenge on some of this stuff is just to figure out if someone else is offering it, how, how who makes that determination and, and how. So we'll come back to a and to ask that question. Okay. Thank you. Uh, um, so that first waiver provision, it's in those municipalities where um, solid waste services are being offered as part of municipal services. So a commercial hauler in that municipality is not required to comply with, with the requirements of, of universal recycling if um, the material addressed is, is addressed in a, a municipal ordinance. It's applicable to all residents. It prohibits a resident from opting out of the municipally provided services. And the municipality doesn't have a variable rate, i.e. they've incorporated the cost into their taxes. So, so that, that one's probably limited in application. Sub three is the broad um, waiver provision. 
a commer commercial hauler is not required to comply with 1A or B, so mandated recyclables or food residuals, in a specified area in a municipality, if ANR has approved a solid waste implementation plan for the municipality, for purposes of the waiver for mandated recyclables, the secretary determines that under the approved plan, the municipality is achieving the per capita disposal rate. Um, the, the municipality demonstrates that its progress toward meeting the diversion goal in the state solid waste plan is substantially equivalent to that of municipality complying with the requirements of the mandated recyclables. Uh, and then the approved municipal plan delineates an area where solid waste management services required for mandated recyclables or food residuals are not required. And in that delineated area, there are alternative services, including on-site management. So on-site composting, something that we need to be taken into to consideration are offered and those alternative services have capacity to serve the needs of the residents. Then the fourth, they're actually the third a uh, waiver provision, a commercial hauler is not required to comply with the requirements of A or B. So mandated recyclables or food residuals um, collected as part of a litter collection program. So on green up day, they don't need to separate food residuals from the rest of the solid waste that's co collected. Um, so that's waiver. Uh, I don't know if any haulers have applied for waiver under subdivision three there, but that if they were looking to do it would probably be their best alternative. Uh, oh, something just happened to my screen. Oh, there we go. All right. So um, in sub three, there's emergency authorities. So generally the governor and the emergency management division um, have a statutory authority to act to protect the public peace, health, and safety during times of emergency. Um, generally, that applies in an all hazard event. Um, and an all hazard event includes natural disasters, civil insurrection, terrorist attacks, and health or disease related emergencies, which I think we all agree a pandemic is. Now, once a state of emergency is declared, the governor is authorized to exercise certain powers for as long as the governor determines the emergency to exist. These powers are set forth in Title 20 in three different sections and include employing measures and giving directions to the state or local boards of health. I included that because the authority of the state or local boards of public health is pretty broad related to public health issues. They can declare public um, health hazards and, uh, and basically uh, require certain restrictive measures. Uh, the extent of the governor's emergency power is, is something of an open question. Uh, there have been courts around the country that are, are litigating that issue right now. Um, and there have been some varying opinions. For example, in Texas, uh, a district, federal district court said that um, the governor can infringe on and basically take away constitutional rights uh, during a time of emergency. Whereas in Alabama, the court said, no, uh, it doesn't extend that far. Obviously, there is some restriction on constitutional rights, such as right to travel, but the right is not taken away. Um, and so the the, that issue has not been addressed squarely and by the Vermont Supreme Court or, or, or the federal district courts in the Second Circuit, but um, the, the governor basically has broad authority. How broad is still kind of up in the air in this jurisdiction. Um, there's also specific emergency authority for solid waste facilities, and it's really, it's, it's fairly limited. It's when there, there's need to be an emergency action for the disposal of solid waste, the agency can issue a provisional certification. Um, that's really, it's, I just included it there because if, if for some reason there's no ability to dispose of food residuals or manage food residuals in a facility somewhere in the state, the agency has basically the ability to issue a provisional certification for it. Um, and for a limited time. Uh, and then 
for enforcement discretion. Uh, enforcement discretion is not a statutory authority. It's derived from the constitution and, and common law, judge made law precepts. Um, basically it extends from the take care clause of the Vermont constitution and the concept of separation of powers. The take care clause it's, it's a very short clause. It basically says that the governor shall take care to execute the laws of the state. Um, but it has been interpreted to allow enforcement agencies discretion and enforcement of the law. Um, and it's that kind of makes sense because you want agencies to have the ability to determine if, when, and how to enforce a law. Um, an exercise of enforcement discretion is generally unreviewable by courts. It's a separation of power things. Courts aren't going to go in and tell an agency when they have to enforce or how they're going to enforce. That's really not the court's purview. But an agency <laughs> can, can exercise enforcement discretion unconstitutionally, for example, discriminating against a protected class. Um, and they can't violate the general precepts of, of enforcement discretion. Um, the major precept of enforcement discretion is that it's supposed to be on a case by case individual basis. You're supposed to apply the facts of an alleged violation to the law and to the situation at hand and to determine whether or not and how to enforce. So it's not supposed to generally be applied categorically. It's not supposed to be there to undermine the legislative policymaking. The legislature, the legislature has the supreme legislative lawmaking authority and policymaking authority, and agencies can't undermine that by choosing to categorically not implement enforcement of the law. And the greatest example, most recent example of that is the Obama era um, DAPA policy and for immigration policy where Obama said that they weren't going to enforce immigration laws to parents of uh, to undocumented parents of children who were born in the United States, and we, we, they were going to grant deferred action status to immigrants. Well, that wasn't the law at the time. That wasn't what Congress said, uh, and the decision to categorically not enforce immigration laws was not within. President Obama's authority and the courts overruled him and said, you can't use enforcement discretion to make law and policy that conflicts with Congress. Um, and then last, uh, there's rulemaking authority. The agency has a very broad grant of rulemaking authority under the solid waste management chapter. Uh, it basically says that they have authority to adopt rules to implement the solid waste chapter and their universal recycling requirements are in that chapter. So agencies with rulemaking authority can adopt emergency rules when there is an imminent peril to public health, safety, or welfare. So theoretically, a &R has the ability to adopt emergency rules to address the management of mandated recyclables or food residuals um, during the pandemic. Um, and for the agency has, uh, specifically the Department of Fish and Wildlife, has exercised emergency rulemaking to push some of its, uh, its requirements during the pandemic. So the agency knows how to use emergency rulemaking um, to address an imminent peril to public health, safety, or welfare. Emergency rules have a maximum duration of 180 days, but LCAR can object if it's beyond the agency, the authority or inconsistent with legislative intent. So I, I would expect if the agency tried to waive entirely some of these re universal recycling requirements or, or make certain broad um, exemptions that you'd probably have interested parties uh, request that Alcar object to such such an action. And then it would be up to Alcar. I think at least two of you are on Alcar, so you know how that goes. Um, uh, certain A&R programs have been delegated authority to adopt rules. Well, I, 
I'm sorry, I haven't provided context for this. Um, in addition to just the ANR's general rulemaking authority, there has been uh, there has been efforts in the past by the General Assembly to give an agency rulemaking authority to act during emergencies. If you remember during Tropical Storm Irene, uh, Governor Shumlin basically used his emergency authority, um, which I already summarized, to waive the stream alteration permitting requirements so that uh, municipalities and others could go into streams and remove debris that was threatening infrastructure and threatening to, to cause more flooding. After Irene, the legislature said, well, maybe when that happens for stream alteration, there should be some parameters for how it happens. So the General Assembly gave a &R the ability to adopt rules to say what the expedited permitting or other requirements were uh, during times of emergency for stream alteration. So that, that's an option for the legislature. If you wanna, and going prospectively, if pandemic is going to be something that lasts more than a few months, you could potentially give a and uh, rulemaking authority to address how they would um, manage solid waste issues during an emergency. So that's, those are the options that are out there. Um, I don't think I missed anything, but uh, you know, the agency's rule is like 190 pages long. So there might be something in there that I missed. Um, Kathy could probably correct me if, if anything on here is wrong. Mr. Chair. Yeah, Senator McDonald. Um, I did, I've been, this has been quite fascinating. And I, um, I'm asking for you to help us understand what our goal is today. Um, I had a, I got a, just a couple questions. We learned yesterday that the, um, that the, the haulers have, have made some, what we, many of us would say were common sense decisions to put off mattresses and electronic waste for an undetermined period of time as they seek some guidance on how to um, move forward. Um, I, they may have been not complying with the rules, but everybody go, has, many people have said, well, that makes sense. They're, they, they've made some common sense choices and they're ready to hear what we would have them do going forward. The second one is where um, we've got the new separations coming up of food wastes from other um, materials that get hauled away starting on, on July 1st. If those had been in place two months ago, um, before the pandemic, um, we've been wrestling with whether or not the haulers should have stopped separating during this time period. So I guess I'm asking um, what is it that we would as a committee achieve, uh, seek to achieve um, as these new, as the new statute goes into place on the 1st of July? Um, and what are perhaps two or three options that Mr. O'Grady might say are available to us? So thanks for those clarifying questions. Uh, you know, my goal has been all along that we hear testimony so we understand what's going on in the field, have a, a better, then we will need to decide as a committee, are we hearing things that make us feel as though um, the requests are, you know, have merit. We should, we should accommodate uh, some kind of altered practice, whether it's not picking up something or not separating something. And the, uh, we only need, I think, to act on that as a committee if there's not already adequate uh, discretion at the agency for accomplishing the same thing. And so, uh, because I've only heard in bits and pieces some of these kinds of allowances before, that's why I asked Michael to try to corral all that into one presentation um, so that we could better understand. And we have agency with us to see uh, if there's a request we've been hearing about 
that actually already would be, uh, could be accommodated through one of the six approaches that Mr. O'Grady just walked through. I, I, I take, took in my notes, Mr. Chair, one, one sentence from yesterday's testimony having, having to do with food waste that was perhaps the most interesting truth that was offered to us and it was sort of food waste. It's going to be picked up one way or another. Uh -huh. And the question is, um, the law on the 1st of July says it will prescribes a way in which it will be picked up under statute. And it's going to be picked up one way or another. Um, is is the a possible course of action to allow the um, to, to, to acknowledge that the administration may make a determination on this particular issue during the pandemic, if the administration believes that it is, uh, the pandemic is affecting um, such a decision. Um, yeah, well, that certainly, so I think maybe we should pause. I know we only have Michael for another 32 minutes, so. Pause um, thank you. <laughs> so, no, I think I, I'm not putting it off. I'm just saying it, this would be a good idea. I mean, I think we're gonna need uh, to ask uh, Commissioner Walk to w weigh in so we can get a little bit of a discussion going back and forth here as to whether or not the six routes to providing for flexibility, if we wanna call it that, if they don't accommodate the kinds of requests we heard yesterday. So uh, then Mr. Chair, um, is there any, I guess we might look if there's any reason that the statute taking effect when the statute is supposed to take effect would in any way thwart um, the governor's um, um, authority or recent generally approved practice of dealing with this COVID environment if were he to make some changes in the rule in the law that's going to take place on the 1st of July and if so I mean that's our question is it not yes right thank I mean, you thank you for pointing out also you know I had um and it actually sort of gone right by and I hadn't thought of it as a, a that uh, solid waste districts were deferring, accepting certain kinds of waste, like electronic waste, et cetera. I hadn't thought about that, but right, that normally they'd be required to do so. So yeah, mattresses, you know, sofas, things like that, that, that they're in doubt about and they're waiting for guidance. Yep. Right, right. Okay. So uh, Commissioner Walk, do you wanna, uh, what's the, you, you've heard Mr. O'Grady's presentation is it your sense that requests that the agency is interested in responding to are can be accommodated under one of these six different approaches that Mr. O'Grady just walked us through? Uh, sure, and let me apologize in advance both to the committee and to, to Mike for my internet uh, over the last uh, half an hour has been its most spotty all for the last two months. Uh, and so I just had to reset my router and uh, and did not get as much of Mike's overview as I would have liked to have to have been able to you know fully answer that. But I do have the document and have been reading through it. Um, and I appreciate the 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 walkthrough. I think the some of the 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 primary variance piece that that Mike went through uh, is really looking at um, uh, uh, issues. And I appreciate that he highlighted the sort of uh, issues with rules rather than with with statute. Obviously, um, you know there are pretty clear statutory requirements. And then if we get into the question of, of using enforcement discretion, we um, have already uh, used uh, enforcement discretion in different contexts to try to address issues. Um, and our goal with the use of that is, as, as he described, what is to be very discreet in its use and uh, only when absolutely necessary. So in most contexts, 
we've created an opportunity for people to avail themselves of it if it's needed, uh, but not necessarily uh, have to have it occur if it's not needed. So most of um, the, the specific policies we've put forward have, we have not gotten any requests uh, to have individuals or businesses avail themselves of those requirements. Um, we did early on uh, use enforcement discretion to uh, primarily assist, uh, help assist groceries who would otherwise, grocery stores would otherwise need to be uh, collecting uh, bottle bill uh, bottles uh, to be able to focus on stocking shelves. Um, as you discussed yesterday, most of those um, facilities have gone back to the collection of, of bottles and cans because, um, and as, as Senator Perrin alluded to, I think a, a, at some point, uh, the you know different uh, facilities have are actually looking for that content more and more because of its clean stream, um, and so I, I guess the request that we made that were the proposed language that we put forward uh, to this committee and to House Natural Resources what about a month ago was really to uh, to seeking while you were in session your explicit authority in that policy making realm. Um, given that there were open questions uh, and we didn't feel like there was a, the exact sort of fit between the flexibility and tools that you've given us and, um, and this situation. And so the idea was to provide for that explicit authority. I would divide those into sort of two categories. One is the impending uh, a finalization of the of the food residuals ban, uh, which uh, has primarily been around the ability of of haulers and facilities to prepare for that ban in this moment. Um, there is also an economic question that is is for yours to, to for you to answer about whether or not it is a uh, it what how the burden falls relative to uh, the other economic pressures on businesses in the state of Vermont. Um, and then the second bucket is really, how do we ensure the worker workforce is protected for haulers and for facilities? And in the event of a situation where that, that workforce becomes compromised, are there, are there flexibility measures that can be utilized to make sure that we're continuing to collect solid waste from Vermonters and Vermont businesses, but uh, not necessarily, uh, not in the same way as business as usual to make sure that we can continue to do that. And those were really the, the efforts that we put forward in order to have that conversation with you at the policy level. I, 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 I think that I'd be interested in Mr. O'Grady's perspective on on which situations might uh, that he's laid out might fit those um, two categories best. I think there's different ways to to look at it. Um, certainly, our legal counsel has taken a look, and that's frankly why we put forward the language that we did so that we would provide sort of a clean, very clear direction from you. Um, and that would only be used in a, you know, especially for the, the collection and disposal requirement pieces would only be used in specific circumstances as needed, sort of tightly defined. The, the I think, so without starting to walk through the, the exact language, I think one of the concerns I had about, well, one is as a starting point, if something's already accommodated through law or practice, whether it's statute, rule, constitutional provisions, then I would say, okay, well, let's not let's not act, let's not be duplicative or, or um, maybe even muddle things a little bit by sort of overriding or overlapping something. You know, if we can already do it, um, and so I think it's really that's sort of the conservative approach I'm taking. It's not it's not like we're stonewalling it's like let's not 
meddle if we've already in some form addressed it, you know. Um, uh, that said, the language I saw was, it was quite broad, like waiving, you know, food residuals or recyclables. And it was sort of uh, class-wide. There was nothing in that language that's, that suggested that there would be an applicant asking for a waiver on a particular, like a case-by-case -case basis. So I'm just trying to understand how broad a brush a and R is asking to be, you know, sort of handed in this case. That's that's fair. Um, it is our intent under the the way that's written. And let me, um, if you'll give me a moment, I'll pull that up. But the the frankly the idea behind it being that it would be something that uh, was a you know, that the secretary granted upon request from a hauler or from a solid waste management district or a, you know, swimming in general. So that was, that was the way it was conceived. I, I, I'll, let me, because I had to uh, shut down all my tabs and restart uh, my internet, I'm a little, I don't quite have all the information in front of me at the moment. Yeah, I, well, this is one of the, one of the zoom downsides is not sitting at a table with all the papers in front of us that we can just move seamlessly between. I, I appreciate that. Um, you know, so maybe to be systematic about it, one way to, to do this would be to take Mr. O'Grady's memo and ask you if you're ready to do it now, fine. I mean, I know it's, it's um, comp, whatever. There's a lot of detail here. Maybe you haven't had enough time to consider it all, but uh, maybe we could walk through the six different um, routes to flexibility, whatever we call them. And you can say whether or not you believe they offer ANR adequate flexibility or not, just so we understand how you're reading them. When I read these six in aggregate, I feel like it's a pretty full toolkit that uh, ANR could use in order to respond to um, individual cases where there, you're seeing some, you know, perceiving a, a need to respond for either those, any of the reasons you think are valid. Um, so you want to, how about we do that? Does that seem workable to you? Or have you not, is that not a fair request because you haven't had enough time to look at Mr. O'Grady's memo? I realize you're just looking through this now with us. Um, I, I will do my best, and uh, but I think given the, the time that we have available to us, I'm happy to walk through and give my initial impression uh, and hope that my legal counsel doesn't cringe as I speak from time to time. Um, so I would, so starting with the, the first category, the sort of general variance, um, I think the, the first section is really about uh, variance from rules. Uh, so the section A, 1A there is, is about uh, variance from rules, given that the requirements that we're discussing are laid out clearly in statute. I think that's pr problematic from a direct variance perspective. Uh -huh. um, in 1B, it's, um, it's, I don't, and, and maybe Kathy can weigh in whether or not we've ever authorized a, a variance under 1B, mm -hmm. uh, but it does seem like maybe not the most responsive to a public health crisis if we get to that point. And that's really what we're talking about if we, if we get to the point where we need to institute these sorts of measures. Um, and so I would ask Kathy to weigh in on whether or not we've ever issued uh, a variance. We have um, that you know, one B came from the original universal recycling law. It was directed specifically to facilities only. And we have, um, for example, there were two Casella transfer stations that were located really close by to where food scraps were already being locally uh, collected. So we were able to grant a variance to those two facilities for the collection of food scraps since there was already a convenient and um, um, uh, 
sufficiently uh, capacity for collecting food scraps in that area. But it's for facilities. And right now, I think the question before you is really with respect to haulers. Is that St. Albans in uh, Georgia? Um, no, um, one was um, um, in um, Williston and the other one was in Montpelier. Thank you. Um, okay, and the lead in language in A. All right, sorry, no, never mind. I was just saying, thinking about how it's, it's broader. For instance, it includes a process. And I don't know if collection is actually a process. Yeah, um, Michael and I had that discussion, but we don't have hollow requirements in our rules. The hollow requirements are only in the statute. So, and A is specifically about the rules, as Michael pointed out. Yep. Thank you. Um, um, Mr. Any, you want to go on to category two waiver? Yes, that seems seems appropriate. Thank you, Kathy, for weighing in. Um, so the the category two really looks at the um, the kind of off ramps for hauler requirements that you've put into statute um, around the universal recycling law and trying to understand how that might be used. Um, I, th I think the, we're, because we're not in a, uh, fully implemented mandate status, it's difficult for haulers to provide clarity or to, to the agency around whether they can meet the, the stipulations of those waivers. Um, essentially we're in a chicken or an egg scenario. Um, and so it's, it's, we may get to the point where, where one of the compost collection only businesses expands into an area where, uh, where, you know, and they're looking to expand their collection, but they're not there yet. And therefore, um, would require a hauler who might get to the point where they could apply for this waiver, um, can't do so yet because there isn't sufficient capacity to cover all of their customers. Okay. Um, and is so that that capacity to provide service to all customers that bears on the hauler. I mean, so if some, is that correct? In other words, if someone says, well, uh, a, someone who's collecting, or food residuals for a composting business directly, someone like a grow compost, for instance, is going to, all these businesses are operating statewide, they seem to be growing. Um, if they're expanding into an area, but uh, they're only going to um, larger institutions, for instance, does that, are the, are haulers, still required um, under current law to also offer organics because they have customers and uh, someone is not offering that service to their customers. Now that's what the, that's the chicken and egg thing I see is who, who has the requirement to ensure first that um, every customer who's at, at the four units and above level has access. The current hauler servicing those people. I can offer something on that if you'd like. Uh, please, yes, thank you. Oh, okay, um, so um, first of all, this um, requirement is not in effect until July one. Uh, we have provided guidance on that. Um, there isn't a process where um, the hauler has to get approval from A and R. Uh, you know, that the, the waiver isn't, um, you know, like a permit or anything, but they need to be assured that um, if they're not going to offer the collection of food scraps to their, you know, non-residential customers, that's the only requirement, um, that there's someone else that can in that area. We have offered to help them make that determination if they'd like. Um, we're very much informed about, you know, um, who is offering 
services in which areas. Uh, remember all solid waste haulers, including food waste haulers have to get a permit from us. Um, and we are collecting information and keeping track of who is offering food waste collection in which areas. Um, so we're happy to assist haulers in making that determination. Um, and I think this is going to continue to expand. You know, you heard um, Grow Compost say yesterday that they're operating in many of the counties, maybe all of the counties, Vermont, and maybe they're not hitting every town. Um, there are business opportunities where other haulers are also trying to get into the game. So it is evolving. And uh, I don't want to get us too far into the weeds, but the second half of that section two waiver, uh, then G1B, the last sentence, commercial haulers shall not be required to offer collection services, et cetera. Is that constrained to just uh, non-residential customers or is that referring to all customers? Okay. So in other words, so, residential, right down. Right, so, I'm sorry. Well, just that it, are we talking about it's that it's residential customers and you know, right down to the single household level? No, the, the residential customers um, were re removed from the haulers requirement last year statutorily. Okay. So they have to offer the service only to their non-residential customers or apartment buildings with four or more units. Okay. And uh, so, that's, that's the, um, the, the group that we're looking at for them to provide the service to. All right. So um, I know we're constrained on time. So it's, we're, we're not going to sort it all out today. But if, um, so, Mr. Commissioner, if you could continue on with anything else you want to talk about in category two there, waiver from commercial hall or collection requirements. Um, um, I, I think we pretty much addressed that one. Um, I think there is that obviously we've, we've worked to put guidance in place to make uh, that process as, as seamless as possible. But as a, as a business owner, I would feel somewhat at risk of being out of compliance if I wasn't sure that I could guarantee that an alternative existed to provide service to all of my customers. I think that is something that we need to be very, very mindful of as we go forward. Okay. Uh, and how about sub three in that same uh, waiver collection? So beginning with uh, a commercial hauler is not required to comply with the requirements. Uh, it's on Mr. O'Grady's page three. Uh, well, <laughs> I don't know. I have a strange page break here, but at any rate, that that version that I think he actually indicated might be one of the more approachable ways of coming at this. If they would, if a hauler wanted to make a request, is that the SWIP provision? I, I don't have that document. That is that is the SWIP provision. Okay, um, so I, yeah. Go ahead, Kathy. That, that's original um, universal recycling law. Um, and because there can be, and most of the time are, more than one hauler operating in an area, um, they wanted um, to have a process where um, all of the haulers either have to provide the service or don't provide the service. So um, we, um, so it has to go through the, the solid waste implementation process, which is either the district or lines or independent town, um, and come to the agency as a re revised SWIP for review and approval. Um, this process was used for Northeast Kingdom um, originally, five years ago, six years ago, when they um, wanted to be um, exempt from the haulers of providing pickup of recyclables, and they were approved um, for that, um, that waiver through the SWIP process. Um, I will share that um, many of the haulers and some of the swimmies find it to be a bit of an awkward process. Um, and that's why last year we changed the requirement so that um, the haulers were only required to uh, pick up food scraps from the non-residential 
um, customers. That was the compromise, remember? Um, That's what it stopped being universal and became bifurcated. Yeah. Um, but I, I think the, the, the key point um, that Kathy's raised is that that could be a process that would work. It's, a, it's probably a timeline question mm -hmm. um, and, and whether or not uh, the, the, a, a district or a, uh, Alliance or an independent town could get together and revise their plan, submit their plan, have us review their plan in a, in a way that uh, was timely um, for a public health emergency. Okay. Um, I can imagine that uh, would take some, some time. So then if we move ahead uh, to emergency authority, how applicable do you see that category three um, as providing a remedy to these situations, particularly since we're operating under uh, an emergency order right now? Uh, I, I think that it, it is something that uh, I don't, I think as, as Mike described what the limits of that authority are, have, are not entirely clear. Uh, could it be used? Probably, but that's in my mind. It's really for things that are are needed on a true imminent uh, risk sort of basis. Um, I think the Irene example is a good one. Um, in my mind, if we have the as we've had the time for a deliberative uh, legislative policy discussion to determine whether a tool is needed, uh, then it's probably does not necessarily uh, uh, fit as well with this category. Okay. Um, the, the public health piece of it, I think is, you know, maybe the most persuasive reason for, for considering waivers and that seems like in the midst of a pandemic a public health uh, a judgment made by the governor on the basis of public health impacts would uh, would seem like a good fit to me but uh, let's let's not debate them all just so I understand I mean is there a reason that does, doesn't seem appropriate I'm not saying it doesn't it, it doesn't fit or doesn't seem appropriate it's a question of whether it's necessary, given that that we have the the are having this discussion right now, okay. If it if if we had uh, issues where haulers were dealing with public health uh, or with 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 issues impacting their workforce, so that we had the potential risk of uh, of solid waste being hoarded in people's homes, then yes, I would I would immediately move forward with you know pursuing something along those lines, that might be appropriate. In the instance where we've had time to have this deliberate conversation as we're on the, on the downslope of our first uh, wave of this pandemic, then we have the opportunity for this conversation to move forward in a, in a deliberate process, which I think is what we're doing here today. And so that, that, that's sort of where, where I make you know, it, it would it would be something we could potentially use. Um, it would it it's not it's not a it's not an it's not an authority that should be used lightly. Okay. Um, since we only have five more minutes with Michael, can we just touch base briefly on the the next uh, the, the yep. remain the so four, I, five, I, six. I, I think for four as as Mike mentioned, I think the um the the it really is about permitting uh, emergency facilities um and i don't think it would apply uh, particularly well here um uh i'm going to touch on uh number six first and then we'll come back to enforcement discretion because i think that's where the meat of the discussion could lie uh for rulemaking we're we have rulemaking authority to uh clarify your statutory guidance um, and I think that, uh, that since the statute is very clear, it would be difficult for us to, or, you know, I don't know if we have the authority to write 
uh, rules that would uh, run counter a statute. Right. Okay. Um, and then for enforcement discretion, um, that really is a is facility and hauler specific, and it's re retrospective in nature. Um, we are choosing not to enforce upon an alleged violation after it's occurred. When we put out authority, um, when we put out guidance um, in this moment, it's been about saying, tell us if you are going to run up against issues where you're going to fall out of compliance. And so that if it meets these criteria, then then we will in, use enforcement perspective. But it is, it is primarily retrospective in nature and doesn't uh, address threats we know to be to be coming that well, okay. uh, or could potentially be coming. Um, Senator McDonald, do you have a question? Um, uh, no, I we 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 have a law that's supposed to take place on the first of July, and this first of July is no different than the the several times we have postponed the implementation of this law. Um, we've even taken the law, which was really universal um, pickup and made it um, and bifurcated it and made it uh, not universal anymore. And we're still talking about not having it go into effect. Um, this is business as usual. Um, usually at this time, the haulers come in and say, we don't have the trucks to do this. Please don't do it now. And we say, well, we'll extend it for you so you can get the trucks. And then a couple of years later, they come back with the same argument. Um, why? There, there is the, the testimony is that if they're picking up solid waste, apparently from homes, they're picking it up now. And if they, after the 1st of July, they're gonna pick up the food waste. Um, why? If we delay it this time, two years from now, there'll be another reason not to do it. Perhaps it is a blessing in this case that uh, there's this health emergency because if it takes a place on the 1st of July, the haulers will know they gotta get the trucks and maybe the, this virus business will give them a couple months to um, do what they have to do to be ready. If we just simply postpone it, It'll be back again two years from now with, we're not ready to do it. So um, glad to see Senator Rogers has joined us because my district probably demographically is the same as his and it's gonna be a lift. But um, we keep, we said we made the lift almost a decade ago, someone will correct me. And we postponed that and, and um, watered it down a couple times since then. And, um, I don't see why this, um, it shouldn't take place on the 1st of July. Thank you. Um, I think uh, before we go to Senator Rogers, I just quick question to clarify something that Commissioner Walk said just a moment ago, and that is, um, oh, well, I've <laughs> They asked, he said that he did, wasn't sure that the governor had the authority to do this and perhaps that it was a wise and thoughtful thing to ask the governor to have to make. And um, I, would, I understand that and I would say most Vermonters have been generally pleased with the decisions he's been made in such circumstances. Okay. Um, Mr. O'Grady had to leave. I'm sorry, I don't get to say thanks. And we'll have to follow up with him when his, again, uh, next week. Uh, no, it was Commissioner Walker, it was the, the question was um, that you were talking about that enforcement discretion is retrospective. Uh, and the, the th I understand that, you know, uh, right. I mean, practically speaking, someone has to fail to comply before there's your, the, the situation even arises. But somehow with redemption centers, for instance, everyone knew kind of prospectively that there wasn't going to be enforcement. So I'm just wondering if, you know, there, it can work both ways depending on how it's articulated by the agency. 
I don't disagree with you, and that, and and we we put um, we put clarity out there and have during the course of this emergency for specific sectors, so that they knew in the instance of coming up against a requirement whether or not they would be out of compliance or held, you know, how we would pursue that being out of compliance. That, that that's true. We're, um, but what? I guess the, the question becomes, we took that action because it felt like something that we could do in the immediate term to be able to address an immediate need um, so that we could focus on keeping food on shelves. Right. This, and is the, uh, sorry, I, have a, I need a, some legal help here. The provision that specifies that someone selling has to redeem is that in rule or in statute? That's in statute. So our, our enforcement discretion applies to both statute and to rule. Um, it, you know, and as, as, as Michael went through, it's, you know, it's, it, it's, it's not necessarily explicit in all forms. It comes from, uh, from constitutional and common law practices. But the um, so yeah so it so yes that was in law um, that is not a it's it's not something that I want to open us up to using on a broad basis in, as a stand-in for your your policy discussions if that makes sense and the other quick check-in on that same issue is for the solid waste districts that uh, stopped accepting mattresses and electronics, stuff like that. Is that in uh, statute or rule? And was that articulated sort of prospectively to those folks so that they knew they could stop doing that, reduce that exposure for their employees and um, there, wouldn't, there wouldn't run into any kind of legal problems? From I'm going to let Kathy speak to that because she looks eager. Right. So, so um, you might recall that um, with the um, uh, uh, state of emergency and stay home, stay safe order, that there was a defined um, list of essential services. And for solid waste, those were defined as um, trash, municipal solid waste, uh, food scraps, and recycling, uh, the mandated recyclables. Those three items only. Um, and we didn't want to have um, um, Vermonters having X more than needed uh, direct contacts with other people. And that's why we were um, not um, allowing the other types of waste materials to be collected at that point in time. It was to pair it with essential services. Okay. And Mr. Chair, we, we've generally been pleased with the administration's ability to make judgments like this and um they, they if years from now they're still sofas not being removed that's a different matter but, so i don't so these and these yeah. are requirements a lot of what we did was about operating hours and other things and those yeah. are specifically in their facility certifications yeah. right um and so it is it is a bit more specificity beyond which you have weighed in from a, a legislative policy perspective. And on July 1st, should this, should the statute go into effect, um, there's opportunity for the administration to show the same wisdom, restraint, and, uh, and decision-making during this emergency. Uh, thank you. Uh, Senator Rogers, you've been patiently waiting. Your turn. Uh, yeah, just a couple more uh, comments um, based on what Senator McDonald said. The, the waste haulers are not buying new trucks because they don't want new trucks. They're not buying new trucks because the business model doesn't make any money, especially in the rural areas. You heard even Jeff Myers, who has lots of urban areas, say that he's not buying the new trucks. Everybody's making less money right now, and, and we're mandating... Uh, people to go out and change their business on a business model that doesn't work financially. And, and in this time, 
with less money moving around the system, it's even harder for them to make those changes. A lot of the solid waste haulers are still paying for the changes they made to meet the recycling requirements, uh, which also don't pay. Remember, recycling's free. Um, so, you know, I, I just think that the, the agency has been behind the eight ball in organizing the implementation of everything in what is now like, what well, Act 148 is like a 10 year or eight years ago since we've been implementing. And or not, or not but um, you know, quite frankly, throw in. Um, it, I've been composting since I was a small child, so it's nothing new to me. Um, and and a lot of people can do it, but the worst thing in the world today is not that a few food scraps continue to go into the landfill for another couple months, or a few pieces of plastic go into the landfill for another couple of months. They're better off in the landfill than they are in the ocean. The bottom line is given flexibility so that if there are health concerns, they can be dealt with. Um, but I don't think there's anybody out there who doesn't <laughs> want to implement all this, but how can people create infrastructure and buy new trucks when the business model does not make money? Um, Senator Campion. I just want to go back to also what we heard yesterday. We did hear from a, somebody who did create a business uh, who's interested in this kind of work. So I don't want to lose sight that there are organizations, companies starting and have been preparing for this, uh, this um, you know, the start of this. And they too keep getting delayed. Um, so I, I just not delayed. They can still pick it up, Brian. Right. So, right. They could still pick it up. And so what was their concern yesterday? Why are they then not interested in having this delayed? I mean, that was their point. I mean, I don't think they got on here yesterday just to make a point because everything was going really well for them. It seemed to me that one of the things that they're, they said was that you know, this has been an expectation. This has been something that's been put forward eight or nine years ago, and it's not helping them and it's not helping others to have it continually, continuously pushed off. But they're in the business of making money from it where the solid waste haulers that you heard from yesterday who are asking for the flexibility, it is gonna be a huge cost to them. And so for anybody who has ever run a business, there's a giant difference. But how is it not going to be a huge cost? How would it not have been a huge cost a year ago, two years ago? Are you looking to Nobody just, can... totally just not do it? I, I don't understand. I mean, this uh, it just seems to me that it's always a huge cost. Why is it more of a cost right now? Why are, are you looking for delay or are you just looking to get rid of it? So are we saying it's okay to put people out of business? John, that's not my question, Senator. Uh, my question is, are you looking for a delay of six months? Or are you looking for this just to disappear? Is everybody going to be on board in another six months? If there's a business model that makes money, they would be. What the state has asked is for them to implement a business model that does not make money. And in some places in the state, the infrastructure is not in place. And so it's, it's a huge difference. If you've got a compost facility and you're making money on compost and you're charging people to dump there, of course, it's a good business model for you. If you have to go out and buy new trucks and run rural routes where you're only picking up a little scrap here and a little scrap there, and then you have to haul it two hours to a compost facility and pay them $80 a ton to dump it there, you're losing money on it. And we're, so we're forcing people to go into a money losing business and we're going to put some of them out of business. That's why they haven't bought the new trucks. They can't afford the new trucks. And so you're saying that the law itself just should never go into effect. I'm there saying the agency there. should have done more work on the ground to make sure that there were facilities in every part of the state and that we were working on infrastructure so that it could be implemented without costing some people 
a huge amount to try to implement it. The business model probably works fine in Chittenden County, in Montpelier, in uh, the, the urban areas. It does not work in the rural areas. There you have it, Mr. Chair. The, 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 that's the, thank, I'm glad Senator Rogers joined us because that's the scope of our decision. Um, and we, what we haven't heard today during this discussion and if we implement this, then people are going to go up on the back roads and befoul them with trash because they have no other choice. Um, but that's what we have before us. And we're either going to move to the next step and put horses out of business and replace them with automobiles or not. So I have a quick, honestly, a quick question for Senator Rogers. When the, you say the business model doesn't work, uh, uh, because haulers are allowed to charge for uh, you know, pick up for anything they're picking up, whether it's residuals, recyclables, trash. Um, why, what's your under, I guess you're not a hauler, so you can't really answer the question, but you may have considered this. Why are they not able to adjust rates to put themselves back in the black? Because they figure if they set the rates where they need to, to make money, they're gonna piss off their customers and and there it's just it's a it's a tough sell and furthermore they would have more competitive rates if they didn't have to haul the stuff two and a half hours like some other districts in the state do right. but their customers have to participate have to have to actually compost we heard from the we heard from the haulers that there's a ton of people out there that are not complying with the existing law the agency hasn't even enforced the existing law and we're asking for for more to go into effect when there's when there's no enforcement so would it be helpful then you know again for this to be enforced that way it will actually help the haulers themselves to make sure that people are signing up to have their organics transported away and those that don't you know we compost here in our backyard and they'll do it that way Mr. Chair, yeah, we we're, still we're, have... we're, we're not going to solve this in the remainder yes. of this meeting, and perhaps we should all come home and compost this idea for a little while and see what <laughs> where we're yeah. going to come out. Well, yes, yeah, so Senator, I, I uh, wanted to do two things. One, Senator Parent has been listening all morning, and now is Patiently. give him a turn here. Patiently. Well, I was going to say, too, I mean, no matter what you do, you can't enforce it at the smallest level. You know, I think of I have two apartment buildings and I have tenants, even though I remind them monthly to recycle, they don't recycle and it ends up in the dumpster. I'm putting compost barrels out for them by July one, but I can guarantee you they're not going to use it. And how do I, you know, how, how do we enforce that? You can't. I mean, I'm using compost now and I think the law allows, you know, I wouldn't pay for it. And what I worry about what Senator Rogers talking about, is they're going to put that flat fee on every customer, whether your compost they're picking up your compost or not. They're going to raise their rates, even if you've decided to invest. You know, I've invested five hundred dollars in compost barrels for my apartment buildings myself because it's a fixed cost, and I can I can do that. But I don't want to have my other rates go up to cover this cost after I made that fixed investment. Um, so uh, on the call, we have still two folks to hear from that couldn't participate yesterday, Susan Alexander and Kim Crosby, who have been patiently waiting. Um, I wanted to do two things. So one, I give the agency a, a, an opportunity to respond to the whole enforcement issue or allegations of lack of enforcement. I don't know if you want to say something about that before we move forward. I'm... Mr. Commissioner? Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, I'm, I'm not going to weigh heavily into the enforcement discussion. That's been part of your conversation this entire time over the last eight years about what the agency's role as the trash police is. And I, I think it's, we can, we can have a full-throated conversation about enforcement and what we want that to look like, but we can't say it's not being enforced in one instance and we don't want you to enforce it in another. Um, in the same conversation without going into more depth there. Sure. So, uh, right. yeah. Well, it wasn't really on our, it wasn't on the agenda for today, so fair enough. But I just wanted to make sure that 
that wasn't presented as fact and you didn't have a chance to say something in, re in response. So before we hear from Susan Alexander, who's from uh, Lamoille, Solid Waste District, and um, Kim Crosby on behalf of Casella, uh, I had also asked um, Jen Duggan, who was former general counsel at ANR, who, who's also interested in the issue and was speaking to the committee yesterday to, to join us again today. Um, hoping she's heard the conversation so far. And maybe uh, as someone who's uh, operated both inside and outside this, this issue, um, inside the agency and outside the agency, if you have any thoughts you wanna share based on what you've heard so far this morning. Senator Gray, before we go on to Ms. Duggan, yeah. uh, you said presented as fact. It, it is a fact based on the people on the ground doing the work. And so I take some offense to uh, the question of whether it is fact or not, when we had at least two of our special interest um, guests yesterday uh, misrepresent facts, and I was the only one calling them on it. So it, it's a little offensive to, to, to question the people on the ground that are picking up the garbage who actually see the violations happening. And I'm not saying I want the a &R to be the garbage police and go out there and find restaurants and, and folks that are um, maybe not able to afford another bill. Okay, well, of course, it's never my intent to offend. The reason I use the word allegation is because for us, in this case, we want to be careful, I think, legally, when we hear testimony like that it is for us hearsay, you know, we don't have, we're not out there doing police work to ascertain whether or not people are or are not doing things. So I just want to say, we have to take many things we hear with a grain of salt until we dig into them and collect um, evidence as opposed to sort of more casual anecdotal stuff. Uh, so I'm just trying to not, not make legal ass assertions that sound rather legal when we don't, we don't quite have the basis for doing that. That's all, I'm just trying to be careful about it. So uh, Ms. Duggan. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, I will keep it brief, but just a, a few quick thoughts after listening to the conversation this morning. I think we talked about this yesterday, but it, I think it's really important to continue to be very clear about what the problem is that we're trying to solve. I think the conversation continues to get confused about what is a COVID impact and what is something that has been a concern for years. Um, and you know, I think that that really shows up when you're talking about workforce protections and public health. I think that we heard yesterday and the takeaway from the CDC and industry guidance is that we can protect frontline workers um, you know, with common sense protections. And so if the concern is public health for the workforce, you know, that seems to have solutions. If we're concerned that we may lose staff because staff is getting sick, that's more of a facility specific problem and not an industry wide problem. And so when you start getting into situations where there's a particular business or a facility impacted directly by you know, the pandemic, a public health emergency, then you really are into um, enforcement discretion box. You know, what, we, what the agency is asking for is very broad. It's not tailored, it's not requiring someone to stand up and say, this is how it's impacting me. We haven't really heard, um, we haven't really heard about industry-wide impacts. In fact, we're hearing from some facilities, everything is going fine, other businesses are ready to start July 1st. So it seems to me like this is something that would warrant a case-by-case -case approach, which is, you know, enforcement discretion is an appropriate tool for that. Um, if it's exercised in accordance with the guidelines and the parameters that Mr. O'Grady laid out. Um, the other, the last thing I just wanna make sure that the committee is aware of, and I, I don't think that Mr. O'Grady mentioned this, but ANR has already issued a general enforcement discretion policy. 
So they've already given guidance to regulated entities in terms of how they're gonna go about exercising enforcement discretion. Um, and it's very specific. Um, it requires that the person that is, you know, that is seeking to, um, to have that waiver, they have to show, the burden is on them to show a couple of things. Um, Non-compliance was unavoidable because of the pandemic. It didn't result in a significant public health or environmental threat. They took steps to mitigate the harm. They notified ANR and they're immediately working with ANR on a schedule to come back into compliance. So the agency has already put that guidance out there. Um, and I'm, I'll, I'm happy to send the committee you know, a copy of that document. And they've already shown that they can issue specific um, guidance where there's a, a COVID issue like bottle redemption centers or that's posted, it's public, it's transparent and they're being very specific, it's narrowly tailored, it's time limited. Um, so those are just a couple of my observations from listening to the conversation this morning. I think that the agency has the tools that they need to address facility by facility case specific challenges with compliance. And I haven't really, you know, I haven't really heard sort of industry wide COVID impacts. Um, and then again, I would just urge um, the committee members to be really clear about what the problem is that we're trying to tackle. If it's a long term issue, these are really important issues that we need to you know that the state needs to talk through and address but it's it's really problematic to lump it in under a covid-19 umbrella and that's where i think the confusion is happening well thank you um seems like one uh, it's always helpful to have a legal organized legal thinking applied to defining a problem and sorting it out so um, and you know, your thanks for the reminder too about that letter. The committee had seen it. It, it came up very early in the the whole pandemic uh, timeline, and the secretary sent us a copy. And we had a presentation from Secretary Moore and Commissioner Walk back. I forget close to when we left the building, not not long after. Um, as you have your hands on that document, right? Now, and I don't. Um, can you just send it to Jude, and then uh, I'll ask her to circulate it to everyone. So we'll have a second. We'll have a copy at hand without having to uh, dig through committee online day by day files to to find the thing. Sure, I'd, I'd be if happy. If it would to please the that. the committee and Miss Doug and I, am happy to provide it as a sort of official document from the agency, if that would be more helpful. Sure. Uh, thanks. Thanks for that offer. So, Jude, when you get it from the commissioner, can you please send it around to everyone? Thanks. And I would just note that, you know, that policy really lays out, you know, some really important factors about how to look at and evaluate case by case um, compliance issues within, you know, the context of this pandemic. That those guide that those criteria, the burden shifting on the applicant that's seeking the waiver, all of that is missing from the ANR proposal related to the waiver of the, you know, the recyclables. So I think it's important to compare what ANR is proposing now to that those criteria and the policy. Right. All right. Thank you for thank you for that. Yeah, I it has seemed to me like um under the covid situation has brought the issue back to the forefront again but then uh, other issues are sort of jamming their way through the door along with covid to say hey while you're talking about that uh, I, I have an ongoing concern that i want to get back on the table so it's uh it has not been helpful to have the things getting conflated absolutely um committee do you have does anyone have uh questions for Ms. Duggan. All right, so thank you again for um, your help and we'll continue to work. So uh, committee with, uh, we have two witnesses who weren't able to join us yesterday and I said that we, we would roll some time over to today. 
So I would like to invite um, Ms. Crosby to join us and then we'll hear from Susan Alexander as well. Um, so good morning, Kim. Good, good morning, can you hear me? Yes, ma'am. Oh, great. Well, good morning or afternoon by this point. Um, thank you for allowing me to come on today. Um, I've been listening for the last hour and a half and it does seem like there's a lot of um, confusion between some historical issues with the universal recycling law getting mixed in with the COVID-19 pandemic. And I just, I just would like to be clear that um, our request was strictly based on the COVID-19 pandemic and wasn't meant to bring up these historical issues. Although I do think there clearly are some that do need to be addressed. Um, but for the record, uh, Kim Crosby, an environmental compliance manager with Casella. Um, I've been working in the environmental field since I graduated from Johnson State College with a degree in environmental science. I'm one of the few members of my graduating class that continued to use their degree. I've spent my entire working career in the environmental field because I recognize the importance and the value of protecting the environment and public health. Um, I've been with Casella for 14 years. And I'm proud to work for a company that shares and exhibits the same values. Um, so I'd like to start again by clarifying the intent of our original ask, because it appears that maybe our, our request has been taken out of context. Um, we're not asking for a sweeping rollback or a dramatic or expansive change to the universal recycling law. And we're not asking for a blanket approval to just start disposing of recycling that we collect. We were simply asking for the secretary to have flexibility to approve disposal of mandated recyclables only in certain circumstances where and when disposal would be warranted due to the pandemic. We're asking for the same flexibility that we have in other states that we operate in. And it's the same flexibility that we asked for and received back in 2008 when the legislature approved disposal of mixed paper after China implemented the National Sword Program, stopping the importation of mixed paper from the United States. We did everything we could during that time to continue to move mixed paper to other markets. So fortunately, we did not have to ask the secretary for approval. But nonetheless, the authority was there in the event that we needed to use it. And that's what we're really asking for here. I view this as more uh, a request for flexibility as more of a contingency plan being put in place only during a state of emergency. Nothing nothing on a permanent level. Um, Casella has made significant investments into recycling infrastructure across our footprint and more recently invested into a Recycle Better campaign, educating people on what does and what doesn't belong in their recycling bin. We also collaborated with the agency on their Recycle Like You Live Here campaign. Um, also, due to the closure of all but one of the residential drop-offs operated by CSWD, Casella set up a fast trash operation for the town of Milton so residents could have a place to bring their trash and recycling. Right, right now, residents are generating the most waste due to the stay-at-home order, so we thought it was imperative that they have a place to bring their material. So, so we're not, again, we're not looking to just start disposing of recycling. That's why I bring up those, those points. Um, as far as the safety of our employees, um, we are continuing to follow the safety guidelines issued by the CDC and the Vermont Department of Health. Our employees have completed the training that was distributed by the Department of Health at the end of April. Um, and our safety team has done a great job in ensuring that our people working on the front lines are kept safe by wearing proper PPE. That includes gloves, glasses, high visibility vests, and face masks. We have been fortunate that we have been able to supply our employees with PPE, especially considering that there was a shortage of these items um, and we know that other haulers have struggled to obtain PPE for their workers. So, so I don't think it's necessarily an issue of uh, haulers not wearing the proper PPE. It's the issue of the hauler having trouble getting it. Um, we're also requiring our drivers and our attendants at all of our, uh, all of our employees to practice uh, social distancing from customers and coworkers, frequently sanitize or wash their hands, use wipes, and implement additional cleaning practices at all of our facilities. All, our facilities have remained open. We didn't, we didn't scale back on collecting items like electronic waste because we were concerned that might encourage improper disposal of those items. 
Um, to reiterate our previous testimony provided for this committee and the House, our greatest concern is for the safety of our employees, which has fortunately in Vermont remained healthy so far, and that can really be attributed to the efforts Casella has made to ensure their, their safety. Um, we also worked with the agency to develop some guidance on things residents could do to protect sanitation workers on the front line, and that was developed into a segment that was shown on WCAX a few weeks ago. Um, as far as asking for a delay on the food waste ban, um, as I stated during my testimony at the end of March, we were fully prepared to implement the last phase of the ban. We were, we were in the process of developing a marketing plan that we would provide to our customers that would detail their options for managing food waste. Um, obviously, that plan has been placed on hold due to the state of emergency and is also pending on the outcome of this discussion. Um, the businesses that already are included in the ban on food waste and residents that have already been diverting food waste can continue to do that. A, a delay wouldn't mean that they have to stop diverting their waste. Um, I'm, I'm not necessarily concerned with re residents that can backyard compost because studies have shown that a majority of people in Vermont are already doing that, and it's likely they will continue to do that with or without a ban because they believe in it. What I'm concerned about is the residents that live in state housing, assisted living, or apartment buildings where backyard composting is not an option and they don't have the ability to bring their food waste to a local drop-off. Also concerned about the smaller businesses, and that includes some restaurants that have not already fallen under the ban because they either didn't generate enough material or because they were not located within 20 miles of a certified facility. As callers mentioned yesterday, curbside food waste collection would impose an additional cost during a time when many of us are participating in conversations on ways to defray costs, particularly for small businesses. Um, lastly, I would like to address uh, a comment that was made yesterday that an, entity, an, that an entity that operates a landfill would want to delay the ban so they could continue to gain revenue in the form of tip fees. We have been diverting food waste years before the universal recycling law was passed. An entire division of our company is dedicated to managing organics. Our ask for a delay was based on the concern for our employees having to handle additional containers and us concern for our customers from an additional cost perspective. It was not an attempt to get more tons at the landfill. Um, just because we have expressed a difference of opinion that collecting food waste, particularly in rural areas and transporting it long distances provides little environmental benefit and does not make sense from an economic standpoint, does not mean that we are not supportive of diversion. If we feel or see that a process is not sustainable, we, we reserve the right to speak up on that. And I, I will still stand by that the landfill gas to energy facility at the landfill that powers 7,000 homes 24 seven is an excellent way to manage organics in an area that is currently lacking infrastructure. So if some form of enforcement discretion or emergency authority is possible and more preferable than a delay, then let's, you know, let's continue to have the discussion on what that looks like, how it will work, who it will apply to, because I think that process is going to need to be well understood. Um, we felt it may be easier to request a delay because the process does seem complicated, and, you know, especially based on what I've heard today. Um, and I'd just like to add that I'd be happy to contribute to those discussions um, as necessary. And with that, I'll take any questions. Okay. Uh, thank you. Are there any committee questions? Um, I do have one. Uh, I don't know if you saw um, the Agency of Natural Resources uh, provided a, a model and spreadsheet um, that analyzed greenhouse gas impacts of hauling or, uh, organics continuing to be landfilled versus being hauled. Um, I think it was actually perhaps to Heartland and then just getting into the alternate stream there. Um, and they were, do you have any, I mean, uh, it was, uh, and I think it actually included the carbon footprint of then is, is the current, I think, temporary practice of then going all the way on to Maine. And it was still a net mm -hmm. positive. Have you seen that spreadsheet? It came up only I have, on the last day we were in the building. Yes, I, I have seen that. Um, that's the warm model um, that they used. 
Um, there are a lot of assumptions that are used in that type of model. Um, and as Dr. Fauci recently said, models that use assumptions are only as good as the assumptions put in them. Sure. Um, so I would I would question a lot of the assumptions that were used. Um, uh, that model depends on on many the outcome of those models depend on a lot of factors. You know what type of what type of truck was used, um, the miles per gallon, moisture content. Um, there's a lot of factors that I would I would I would want to know more detail on. Sure. Um, I, 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 sure. Go ahead. Point will take and I would totally all agree models, with that. All models are, uh, what, <laughs> they include assumptions. Uh, great. And I yeah. don't dispute that at all. I do have a, a really a beginner question. I've, as we've heard concerns expressed about hauling organics, uh, you know, significant distances to get them into a sort of a proper handling stream. Um, uh, what occurs to me is that in the state, we haul trash all from far away to Coventry. And I, you know, for the most part, people have accommodated that is that's the way we've closed local landfills. We made a decision, we haul trash, you know, from one side of the state to the other. Um, and that practice seems okay. So I don't know why it is that separating out food residuals and then they may also have a significant hauling overhead built into them. But why is, why is trash different than organics in terms of the hauling? Well, the, the truck that picks up your trash at your house isn't the same truck that's driving it to the landfill from, say, from Brattleboro or Bennington. That truck goes to a transfer station where it's offloaded and combined with other waste from other routes loaded into a, a long haul, a, a trailer, a long haul tractor trailer that's designed for long distance traveling. And that's not the, that's not the way that food waste is currently working. It's mostly small trucks collecting that waste and then bringing it right to a certified facility. I mean, why was the 20 mile radius put in place back in 2011 or 2012? Because was it was it because of distance from from traveling food waste around, or was it from a cost, or you know what? There must have been a reason why why you were requiring a, a 20 mile radius for food waste to be traveled, and, and now that's going to be gone July 1st. So so now we we were considerate before about environmental impacts and carbon footprint when we had a 20 mile radius in place, and now suddenly that's being removed. But, but again, I think, I think that is not COVID related. That is a, a that's another uh, conversation that's been and another argument that's been in place for a long time. Okay. Um, so, I don't think it's very cost effective to, to drive it that far. And I think when you start looking at them at the carbon emissions that right, you're so I don't want to uh, cut you off. Directed, but I want to get an answer because we, Kathy Jamison, I think was part of that discussion and she mm -hmm. probably has some historical information she can share with us. Um, Ms. Jamison? Right. So with respect to the 20 mile um, distance that was put in the original law, right? Um, we borrowed it from Connecticut who used it first. Um, and um, it was its main purpose was not environmentally related. It was so we could develop infrastructure throughout the state. Uh, we didn't want to have just one composting facility statewide. We wanted to have um, regional facilities. And so that was an incentive to build infrastructure. Um, it was not based on any um, um, environmental assessment. Okay, great. So. I'm mindful of the clock, and I also we have um, still waiting to join us is um, uh, Susan, whose last name I'm uh, losing track of. Sorry, um, are you still there? You are Susan Alexander. Thank you. You're a very patient person, um, and it's also timely that you're here to join the conversation in a moment where food residuals are coming back up into the conversation. So if you, since we haven't had you in committee this year, if you could just introduce yourself to folks and and then share um, the information that you'd like us to be aware of. Thank you. 
certainly. Thank you, uh, Senator Bray and all committee members. You guys have been hanging in there for a long time. I've been listening to this testimony and finding it fascinating. Uh, so thank you for offering me this opportunity. My name is indeed Susan Alexander. And for the past 10 years, I have been managing the Lemoyle Regional Solid Waste District. Prior to that, I uh, worked in environmental consulting for 15 years and I have owned and operated my own business. A um, little quick short background about the Solid Waste District in Lemoyle. We um, operate six drop-off facilities, um, including a redemption center. We also have a composting facility that we opened um, in anticipation of the requirements of Act 148. Uh, 17 of our 20 employees do have face-to-face -face interactions with hundreds of customers every day. So we are boots on the ground working with the materials that we're all been talking about today. So the use of personal protective equipment, PPE, is not unique at all to these times of COVID-19. It is indeed part and parcel of our daily operations because we handle over a million beer cans, bottles every year thousands of tons of trash and recycling at our drop-offs and hundreds of tons of the pretrashable food scraps at our composting facilities. Our employees following standard industry operating procedures every day don their nitrile gloves, eye protection, they wear uniforms, use sanitizers, and more. We have more protections in place because they deserve protection of all kinds of flus, viruses, and other pathogens. This is part of our industry and they have always existed in our waste materials. And as I heard yesterday, which I think is really important in this conversation is to parse out the elements of the testimony you're hearing, those that are unique to the coronavirus and those are sort of the long standing and ongoing objections to the requirements of Act 148. So uh, here are the facts that I understand um, of coronavirus. Every trade association or government agency guidance that I've read and researched and that includes the Solid Waste Association of North America, SWANA, uh, the largest and most well-regarded trade industry, and RRA, which is a regional New England um, Recycling and Resource Management Association, uh, national OSHA and statewide VOSHA. They all say that with basic personal protective equipment, there is no need to close nor to suspend operations. And in addition to these um, PPEs, that there are actually administrative and engineering controls that are easily and inexpensively implemented to further protect both our employees and our customers. In addition, the Vermont League of Cities, of two, uh, cities and Towns, which um, most municipalities use as um, their insurer, and as we all know, insurance companies do not like to lose money, uh, they um, employ regiments of actuaries to evaluate risks. So I looked to these professionals and last week they released a um, guidance to us that um, those of our employees who have face-to-face -face, um, contact with the public are at a moderate risk. Those who have administrative and or field duties where there is no face-to-face -face operation or interaction face a um, very low risk of contracting and uh, transmission of COVID-19. And in no case were any solid waste um, employees listed as high risk. In addition, the Department of Health, as you've been hearing earlier, has a very broad authority. And um, we pay very much close attention to what the Department of Health and Dr. Levine are saying. And as he is now um, advising the governor to slowly open up our state, we're paying attention, very close attention. And there hasn't been any guidance from the Department of Health that concerns us in terms of COVID. So these are the experts. We have reviewed and researched the recommendations. We've implemented some of their suggestions and we just have to trust their guidance as it appears to be working. So those are the COVID facts. I'd like to speak a little bit now to um, Act 148. It was eight years ago that the entirety of the Vermont legislature, legislature both the Senate and the House, voted unanimously to pass this law and the brilliance of this law was that it slowly implemented in phases the requirements that were um, surrounding organic uh, diversion to allow time to plan, to build collection and hauling infrastructure and to educate the public and customers. So at Lamoille, we took that mandate very seriously as did many private and public entities across the state. We spent $175,000 renovating an abandoned property 
turned it into a model local composting facility we now call Lamoille Soil, where we are selling out of compost so quickly. In the last two years, we've collected over 225 tons of food scraps, both from our facilities, but also we do have commercial haulers who are out there picking up at institutions, small businesses, and residents alike. So every year we've revisited this conversation and everything I've heard in the last couple of days testimony and for the past six years hasn't changed that fact that, th that it is possible to manage your food scraps separately from your trash. And we have a number, I think I have at least four haulers in our district who are picking up and delivering um, food scraps from residents and small businesses alike. So we're not alone though in advancing these priorities of Act 148. Collectively around the state, the Vermont Solid Waste Managers Association represents 91% of, of the state's population. And they've invested thousands of hours in programs, committed significant resources. Um, I sent, and I believe John Letty from Northwest who represents the Vermont Solid Waste Managers Association has sent you that list. And I'm just gonna um, highlight a few of those things that um, to illustrate the investment that's been made, 22,000 home composting units have been sold. 260 backyard composting workshops have been conducted to teach the proper techniques. There are over a hundred drop-off points right now for food scraps that are being developed through the, throughout the state. 2,500 businesses, 200 schools have received technical assistance. Six composting facilities have been developed with district funds or by partnering with private sector and four districts have developed collection systems within their region that include residential and commercial drop-off. The other thing I just wanna mention here is that um, when we hear people say that the model isn't working, it's because they're trying to fit, you know, the proverbial square peg into the round hole. And really it's just time to think about doing this model a little bit differently. If you think about how we approach the um, local foods and the farm to table program in years past, we as a state committed and we spent a lot of money and expertise helping people develop models for improving the um, production and delivery of local foods around the state. And look where we are now, five or six years later, it's pretty remarkable. And many of us are actually relying on that right now when we don't want to be out going to our grocery stores in public. Um, the tipping fee at our facility is $35 a ton what we pay to deliver trash um, and what um, and recycling to transfer stations can easily be a, above $100 a ton. Right now it's $128 a ton for us to deliver our recyclables to the, tra the Casella transfer station in Hyde Park. So when you look at a business model, you gotta wonder how we can't factor in maybe lower density routes or longer distances against those um, unequal tipping fees. So I know you've got plenty to think about and um, I don't wanna take up any more of your time. I just wanna leave you with a few thoughts, which is that any of the changes that you suggest or consider making to Act 148 now will seriously undermine all those efforts that we um, have collectively, both private sector and, and public sector have um, invested in the last few years. It will considerably jeopardize those haulers who are already offering food scrap collection. And when you are a small business starting out, you are operating a margin. The um, one thing that COVID has clearly done is reduce those margins. So let's not um, zero that out completely by making changes that will uh, negatively impact those existing haulers. Um, you know, there, uh, I'm not saying that there's been lack of planning or preparedness or resources. We've all done what we, we think is appropriate, what's within our bounds but we shouldn't misrepresent any lack in infrastructure now as a crisis, nor should it be used as leverage in time of one. Um, in terms of how you approach flexibility on waivers um, and recycling markets, um, that's driven not by the, the coronavirus, but um, by markets in general. And I think um, with all due respect to the agency, this proposal that they've put forward has really been a huge distraction and there's been so many different things that have been um, intermingled in this conversation that seriously thinking about taking your time to consider how you might do waivers and how might do how you might do um, exercise some flexibility because um, it's not 
an immediate crisis as some would like us to think as it would be because of um, act or because of COVID-19. Um, so thank you very much. I'll leave it at that and I will try and answer any questions should you have any. Great, are there any questions from the committee? Um, I don't see any at the moment. I do have some, so one, thank you uh, again. You did send, um, you emailed the committee some uh, information, I think it was yesterday or the day before. Um, is the facts and figures, and I did go through it, but I'm just not remembering what was in and what was out of. Um, the facts and figures you are sharing today, are they included in the mailing, the email that you already sent to folks? Or is there anything supplementary uh, today? I'll be happy to submit what I said today, just so you have the complete record. I'm not sure. There's a little overlap, but not complete. Right. I know you had a, a cover letter and so yeah, if you and, could... and I also provided guidance that was um, from uh, VOSHA, or I'm sorry, from uh, NRA and yeah. uh, OSHA and uh, SWANA. And I believe you also already have a letter from John Letty from the Vermont Celebrates Managers Association. I'm happy to resubmit that as well. Right. Um, well, in particular, I was thinking you had talked about how many schools, how many you know technical assistants, uh, composting workshops, et cetera. It's helpful because one of the concerns that has come up in broader discussions outside this committee in the Senate is to what degree are we prepared for July 1st? You know, has there been enough publicity? Has there been enough sort of uh, field level outreach and education so that people will make the, the transition over? And um, so that would I would be say the, helpful the pump is well primed right now. <laughs> okay. Um, we, we are we are deluged with calls every single day about this, and um, yeah, those those considerable efforts on both behalf of the private and public sector, I think, um, would would seriously be set back if you made changes to the deadline right now. Okay, I know that here in Addison County, I see posts uh, somewhat regularly from Addison County Solid Waste about um, composting equipment, workshops, etc. Are you, are you doing the same thing, uh, leading that kind of stuff in Lamoille County and using social media or from Porch Forum, newspapers? How are you folks doing your outreach? Yeah, absolutely. Um, we use all forms of social media and prior to COVID, a lot of face-to-face -face conversations with businesses, with schools, with institutions. Um, we recently um, have um, had a forum in Stowe on request of uh, Representative uh, Heidi Sherman to help businesses um, learn about and, and prepare for the, the July 1 um, deadline that had to be canceled live and we're going to be doing it again uh, next month. We also um, have what we call a compost literacy program that we're doing online right now where we have um, speakers, authors, and through the library system um, helping people understand uh, the merits of composting, the pros and cons of transportation and uh, different methods of composting, how it could be done. And we're doing that as we are now through Zoom, uh, through the library system. Okay. Um, one thing that you mentioned, I'd just like to double back to, uh, we've reached out at various points and heard from um, Department of Health, sometimes directly, sometimes through ANR, who has been working with them. Um, can you just reiterate what you were saying about Department of Health? Have you had direct communications with them or are you counting on the governor's office because Dr. Levine's part of the on daily ongoing work to, so that if you should have heard something, you already will have. I, I just wanna be explicit about health uh, related connections here. Yeah, I don't have any um, personal uh, connections with the health department. We have not had one-on-one um, -on -one conversations with them. Um, obviously, whatever social media that they're using, we follow. We follow everything that's being done with Dr. Levine and we use their guidances as well. Uh, they do have broad authority to affect um, businesses and, and look at industries and evaluate whether or not those um, activities should be occurring. And they have not, as far as I know to this point, made any comments about suspending or um, changing up uh, solid waste practices. Okay, great. 
Um, well, thank you for your patience. Uh, My pleasure. A long lead in to, <laughs> to speaking, but um, uh, we're coming up on noon and I just wanna double check. Um, so uh, if I don't, I don't see any other questions from members of the committee, um, and uh, with that, I just want to thank you for your uh, participation and thanks for very helpful. Material. Thank you very much. Um, Jude, can you make sure that um, uh, Ms. Alexander's uh, handouts get posted and then if you could just email them to committee members as well, um, that would be very helpful. And with that, if uh, any other committee business that people want to bring up before we wrap up and adjourn for the day, Okay, so we will plan to be back next Tuesday. Um, I need to double check with leadership on how long floor may run uh, because um, it's a lot easier in when we're in the building to just say we will meet after the floor um, because of Zoom, we have to schedule times, et cetera, and people outside the building end up waiting. So we'll work on what our schedule is for Tuesday, but in general, we'll plan to meet for the foreseeable future, Tuesday through Friday to work on uh, a variety of bills. Um, so, thank you very much. Thank you. And uh, have a great day. Bye-bye.